Well, welcome everyone. Uh, very pleased uh, to be bringing together a wonderful program this evening. My name is Joanne Gear. That's not my picture, uh, but I am the executive director for the Westchester Biotech Project. We are a nonprofit organization that's all about bringing researchers, engineers, and data scientists together uh, across the region and then across the world because everyone's collaborating. Uh, I'm going to hand it over. So you're here to hear Dr. Judith Sheff to speak about her work at uh, NJIT. And I'm going to be handing over the reins to Akila Saravanan. Akila, you can go ahead. It's just going to take me and say hello. And it's just going to take me a minute to set you up as the presenter. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, hello, everyone. And welcome to today's webinar an intergenerational discussion from lab to market. Um, I'm Akila Saravanan, the junior at West Windsor Plainsboro High School North. And I'm the chief editor at Curious Science Writers. Um, so for those of you who um, may not know much about Curious Science Writers, we're a nonprofit organization training high school students um, to be effective communicators and bring complex science to the public through the power of story. So CSW periodically organizes these um, Sundays at seven webinars, um, which help connect students with luminaries and STEM. Uh, today's webinar was made possible thanks to the Westchester Biotech Project and Young Women in Bio, which is a special, special initiative of um, women in bio, both help inspire young girls to become leaders in STEM. Um, today, we have the pleasure of speaking with Ms. Judith Sheff, the Associate Vice President of Technology and Enterprise Development at New Jersey Institute of Technology. Um, through the course of the discussion, we will learn more about the work that Ms. Sheff oversees in the area of research and commercialization. Um, and before we start this uh, webinar, um, please feel free to ask questions in the chat. We'll address them near the end of today's presentation. Um, so to start off today's webinar, Ms. Sheft, could you tell us a little bit about yourself, the work you do at NGIT, and your current roles and responsibilities? Thank you, Akila. It's a real pleasure to be able to join this discussion with folks on the webinar today. I've known both uh, Joanne and Jane Macduff, who are involved with the Curious Science Project and Westchester Bio for a long period of time. And we've all been involved in STEM and women in science and women in, in biotechnology for a long period of time. So it's a real pleasure for me to be able to uh, to participate in this webinar. And a little bit later in some of the conversation, we'll talk a little bit about the role of women in sciences and some of the things that we can do to help promote more women in STEM and even now what we're calling STEAM applications. So I currently work at New Jersey Institute of Technology, which is New Jersey Science and Technology University. And I have a title of technology and enterprise development. And if you stop and think about what is the role of a university, traditionally universities have had three main functions. They have a role of educating students, they have a role of performing research, and they have a role of performing public service within their communities. And within the last decade, a number of universities, and NJIT has been one of the leaders in this area, have also picked up a role of economic development, where we want to be able to use the research and the knowledge that's being created at the university to really help drive economic development within not only our local communities, but more broadly within the states in which we're located or within the United States and perhaps even on a global basis. So my responsibilities around the area of technology development and, at, and enterprise development really revolve around three main focal points. 
One focal point is involved with working with faculty who have made inventions in their research work that they're doing on campus or students who are working in labs with faculty members and helping them think through the process about how we're going to commercialize this piece of technology. And the function works with them to do technology evaluation, assessments, and then all the way through the technology commercialization process. And we'll talk a little bit later about some of the specific details about it. So I'm involved with commercializing, patents, and licensing. Our campus at NJ also has a technology and life sciences business development center known as the Enterprise Development Center. So it's a physical space for early stage startup scale up companies who have some sort of intellectual property as the basis of their business to have a place to be located. And so I have people that work for me that are responsible for operating 100,000 square feet of physical space within our business and then working and supporting the companies to help them move along the commercialization uh, pathway. We have some other programs that we're involved with with some funding for the FET, from the Fed government where again we provide assistance to small businesses, particularly those who are looking to sell products and services to the federal government, whether it's selling products to the military for use in things that they're doing or state and local government. And we have support programs that help companies get registered and find the opportunities to sell into those markets because as you can well imagine, selling into the federal and military government can be somewhat uh, challenging and we want to be sure that small businesses are able to understand the hurdles and get through that. And then the last piece of what I do is I'm involved with really supporting the overall economic resurgence of the activities within Newark. Uh, you may know that Newark is a city that is really on the rise with respect to technology uh, businesses and startups in the overall tech ecosystem in Newark. Uh, Audible was one of the early tech companies who, uh, who moved to Newark a number of years ago. Panasonic has established a location in Newark, there's a number of not only startup companies in our own Enterprise Development Center, but other meetups and other locations within the city where there's just a lot of buzz and hum around economic development using technology as the basis for driving that growth within Newark. And we're involved in a lot of projects uh, helping support the Newark Economic Development Corporation and other things that are going on uh, within the city. So in some sense, because I have all of these different uh, activities going on, I, I get to be involved in, and talk to and work with uh, a lot of different people. So I think at that point I'll stop Akila and let you uh, ask another question. We can uh, go into some more dialogue. Uh, can you hear me now? Sorry. Uh, now I can hear you, yes. Okay, yeah, I appear to have um, switched off. Um, sorry for that. So um, your work seems to be, you know, an interesting intersection of both tech and um, business. So how did you chart your career path? Um, I understand that you used to be, or you were a math major, and then you got a master's in business administration. So how did you make that transition to work um, to work with uh, research labs? Sure. When I started my career, um, I, ended, I started working at uh, Bell Labs uh, in Chicago uh, at, at their location uh, known as, uh, as Indian Hill. And I was working on switching system uh, development. And one of the first things that uh, 
they had us do after we had been working for a fairly short period of time was they had us actually go out and spend a month visiting the telephone operating companies to see how the people who would actually be using the systems that we were building really would use them in their in their application so from a very early start in my uh, career doing development activities i understood the importance of seeing what is the customer what is the end user really going to think about uh, the technology and the products that you're developing and are they really products and services that are going to solve problems that they have so i was working in chicago i had a chance to go visit uh, Southwestern Bell. I visited their operations in St. Louis and then down in uh, San Antonio, Texas, and we visited people in all of the different functions of the telephone company to understand what their needs were. I was working on a system, a software system that was uh, managing traffic through the telecommunications network that would allow the switches not to be blocked during peak, uh, peak calling periods. And, and I have to tell you a, a story because we were there for three weeks visiting, talking to people in, in all of their departments. And on the very, you know, sort of second to last day that they were there, they told us we could do and go back and visit and have really in-depth conversations with any department that we had visited to really get at a, a little bit of additional um, information. And so I asked them, even though I was working in, in software development, I asked them, I said, would it be possible to go to telephone pole climbing school? I want to really see and, and learn about the opportunities of the people who are the line people who are up fixing the telephone poles. And they looked at me and they sort of thought, wow, that's kind of an unusual request, but sure. And so it, it ended up that myself and uh, three other people spent a morning going to uh, telephone pole climbing school to, to really learn and understand how to fix the telecommunications uh, equipment. And part of the reason I tell that story is because I know you're going to ask me, you know, a little bit later on about some of the uh, directions that people should take when they're thinking about their careers. And I really view that as, as an example of looking for and taking opportunities and really getting outside of your comfort zone because I can tell you that climbing a telephone pole is not very easy. They have some poles that have little steps on them and it was fairly easy to walk up the telephone pole with the steps and put on a harness and pretend that you were uh, fixing the, uh, the telephone wires. They have some poles that do not have steps and you put uh, uh, what they call gaffs on your on your legs and you and they're kind of spikes and that you're supposed to really lift yourself up all the way to the top of the telephone pole and I can assure you that unfortunately I did not have enough upper body strength to get more than a couple of feet uh, feet off the ground but again it was an opportunity of really getting outside your comfort zone and trying to see other other perspectives and other dimensions of work that uh, that you're involved with. So I had this degree in mathematics. I was working for uh, Bell Labs doing the uh, switching system um, development work and listening and talking to other people that I was working with at, at, at Bell Labs, I decided that it would be important to, uh, to really go further on this customer activity. And I worked and uh, decided to get, uh, get an MBA. And at the time, Western Electric, which was the manufacturing part of, uh, of Bell Labs, was starting to sell equipment to not only the U.S.-based telephone companies, but was also beginning to sell telecommunications equipment to international telecommunications authorities in places like Korea and China. And so I decided that when I was going to get my MBA that I would focus on really international business to really augment and, and be kind of on the cutting edge of where I saw, saw the, company was, uh, the company was going. I wanted to be able to participate in things beyond just what I had normally, uh, normally been working on. And because I had 
said that I was interested in um, in international business. I had the opportunity while I was working for for AT and T and Bell Labs. I had the opportunity to travel quite a bit both to Europe and to Asia, trying to help sell not only the large switching equipment uh, internationally, but also I had the opportunity because I moved into the semiconductor uh, part of the business to to work on establishing some joint development programs between uh, AT&T and NEC in, uh, in Japan. So it was a real opportunity to, again, kind of stretch yourself and, uh, and, and try other opportunities. And so I would say really kind of one of the lessons associated with that is to really always think about taking opportunities. If something gets proposed as as a challenge or, or a possibility to think, why not try that and, and see how far you're able to uh, able to take it. When I was doing a lot of the work in in Japan, there were not a lot of women who we met with at uh, at the companies that we were dealing with. And you just continued to keep pushing ahead, even though I might have been the only woman on the AT and T team who was participating uh, in the uh, in the projects and and one of the things I think another sort of challenge or or lesson learned is is to make sure that they are heard with respect to perspectives that that you want to bring to the uh, to, to the problems at Bear so that when I was at these meetings I made sure that people knew who I was that I had you know that I had my business cards and that you always are able to contribute. To the uh, to the conversations and the discussions uh, that are going on. The other thing that's important uh, when you're dealing with people from not only other cultures, whether it's a different culture from the U.S., but even other cultures or cultural differences between big companies and small companies, between academia and uh, and industry, is to find a point of common ground in which you're able to. Uh, to deal with people. On one of the projects that we were dealing with in, in Japan, it was pretty clear to me that one of the Japanese uh, people we were dealing with wasn't 100% convinced that uh, his company should be working with, with a U.S. company. And so he was a little bit negative in the business uh, parts of the meeting. And when lunchtime came in Japan, the Sure, you know the cultural norm was you would take your business papers, you would put them on the floor under your chair, and they would bring out uh, lunch. And during lunch, you were not supposed to talk about business. You were only supposed to have other small, polite conversations. And it turned out I had been uh, in New York City the weekend before, and I had seen a Japanese uh, film called Tampopo that was about a noodle shop. And so during this
implementation of our strategic plan, Vision 2020. It's how we're planning to migrate, evolve, enhance the university to what we want it to look like in the year 2020. And one of the really you know, key dimensions that I'd say is critical across the entire uh, educational landscape is really the change in how students are learning. If you think back to early days, it was very much a Socratic method where you would have a learned person delivering a lecture, a lot of people in the classes taking notes and then kind of spitting back information that had been taught to them. Sometimes it might be called sage on a stage or you know spoon feeding information. And what we're seeing today in terms of educational opportunities is that students want the opportunity to really have these hands-on experiences. And so at NJIT, one of our big initiatives for our undergraduate students is a program called URI, or our Undergraduate Research Initiative Program. And all of our undergraduate students, regardless of the technical disciplines that they're studying, whether it is uh, computer science from the Yingwu College of Computer Science or someone from the College of Architecture and Design, one of our engineering students, one of our management students, has the opportunity to propose to work on research projects. And their proposals for the research that they're going to be doing can either be something that is totally of their own idea, something that, that they are particularly interested in that they would like to pursue, or it could be a project that is somewhat linked to some of the research that our faculty are working on. And the students are then able to propose these projects. They get a small stipend um, amount of money that can be used for purchasing supplies and chemicals to be able to, uh, to do the experimental work that they do. And the students then have the opportunity to present the research uh, work that they're doing to external people to present at uh, various poster sessions that are held at the university. And it's really become a whole exper experiential learning opportunity for our students, which becomes so important then when a student is uh, looking for job opportunities to be able to have the, the conversation with a potential employer and not just say, I've had this book learning that I know, but I've actually been in a lab and this is what I have been, uh, I've been able to do. We also have opportunities for our students with the companies that are located in the Enterprise Development Center. Most of those companies were not spin out companies from the university, but were really companies that chose to locate on campus because they wanted to have the opportunity to hire of our students and they wanted to be able to collaborate with our faculty. So on a yearly basis, we tend to have about 300 students who are working with the 90 or so companies that are located in the business incubator. And the companies will put out job descriptions, the kinds of uh, help that they're looking for and students will be able to to work in the companies and have again this really opportunity to really use the learning that they have in uh, in real world situations the other uh, opportunity that that students will have is through internship and co-op programs again more broadly that are typically taking place uh, in the summer where they're able to work with companies and, and get an opportunity to really be in labs and uh, and try things out. And generally, in a student's uh, senior year, they'll participate in a capstone project, uh, which is usually a program where, again, companies will propose problems that they need solutions to, and students in the capstone projects will work on on teams where it could be anywhere from three to to five students 
on a team who will be able to, over the course of the semester, with the um, advice and guidance from their faculty, develop a, a solution to a problem that a company has um, has posed. And so if a student is in the computer science discipline, the companies may have them developing a mobile app or a website application for them. If they're in the engineering field, uh, the company may have a small prototype uh, developed for them. JIT recently also opened up a uh, 3D maker space on campus, so students really have now the opportunity to very rapidly prototype ideas that um, that they have been working on. And so we know that it is just so important to be able to not only have the theoretical underpinnings from an educational perspective, but really try it out and, and see, see what you learn. So uh, obviously researchers would hope to see their products actually uh, manufactured and sold. Um, so who really helps with this commercialization process other than incubators and accelerators? Are there external organizations, maybe um, part of the government or something, that uh, help small startups? And what are the skills required for this sort of... Um, for this Great. Thing? So, so this is a, a great question to talk about commercialization of of technology. If someone is working in in a company or working at a university and they've and they've developed something that they think is a product or a capability, could be a manufacturing process, could be a new product that they think has has commercial potential. Typically, one of the first things that you need to do along the commercialization uh, pathway is once you've really gotten a little bit of, of a proof of concept that the idea is actually going to work is you need to create a document which is known as an invention disclosure where you are disclosing and writing down your invention internally to your uh, to your company or to the university, and in the university, it's typically disclosed to a uh, what's known as a technology transfer office. And in the invention disclosure, what we're trying to do is we're trying to make an assessment of should we patent this invention or not. And there's some legal requirements around uh, patenting. You have to have something that's new and novel can't patent something that's already been been patented or is already known to to others. So it has to be a new and novel invention. And it has to be something that you haven't told other people about yet. So there's a, a notion about uh, keeping confidential until you have gotten some form of intellectual property protection. So one of the things that we do at the university is we'll go into the classes, we'll go into the labs, we'll talk to the faculty, we'll talk to students and tell them if they're working on something that they think might have some sort of commercial potential, we'll ask them to fill out these forms, and they're electronic forms, the invention um, disclosure process so that we can make an evaluation to decide should we get a patent. And part of the reason you want to make this evaluation on getting a patent is because you could get a patent on a lot of different things, but if you're not going to be able to ultimately monetize it or ultimately make money off of it, it may not be the best use of, of funds to be able to, to get a patent. And that might be something where it doesn't make any sort of sense to, uh, to, to get a patent. Some of the, the patents that end up making a lot of money are not necessarily things that you could win a Nobel Prize for that are really fundamental scientific discoveries. So patenting has a slightly different uh, set of criteria that you want to look at as opposed to it necessarily being a fundamental, uh, a fundamental discovery. So once you've made your 
invention disclosure and you've evaluated it in terms of could I get a patent? Do I think there are uh, likely people who would be willing to to license the technology and you've made this determination about where you want to get patent coverage because you have to get patent coverage in each geographic territory in which you are interested in uh, in getting patent coverage for. So sometimes you might only get patent coverage in the United States. If you want patent coverage outside the U.S., you have to get it in each individual country that uh, that you want to get patent coverage for. So it's important to understand where are the big markets for this product, where it's either going to be sold or used or manufactured. But it, in parallel with getting the intellectual property protection, you still need to continue some of the development work because you may, particularly if you're in you know, the early stages of research, you may have gotten something that is able to be worked on and demonstrated in a lab scale situation, but in order for it to be scaled up into a manufacturing process, a lot of things have to have to change and you need to be able to, to demonstrate something is going to work in a larger set of uh, capabilities. And so that while that's going on, typically some of the business people are going to start having conversations with prospective licensees if, if your method of uh, commercialization is licensing it to a larger corporation or if it's something that uh, a team is particularly interested in themselves, uh, starting up a business around some of the people on the team will be looking at uh, starting a business and, and looking for funding and financing uh, associated with those elements. I'll give you an example of one of the projects that we have been uh, working on at NJIT, which is involved with some technology for using uh, visual gaming technologies and some of the Oculus Rift uh, headsets to help children who have uh, vision disorders. So our researcher, uh, Dr. Uh, Tara Alvarez, has been doing uh, vision research for a very long period of time. She's had a lot of funding from the National Institutes of Health. She has a lot of uh, clinical collaborators uh, that she has been working on. And recently, uh, you know, within the last uh, four years, she had a number of students who were working with her in terms of putting eye trackers into Oculus Rift uh, headset. And she had soft, some students who were doing software development who were developing a game which would basically allow your eyes to move a character through a maze, which was effectively then doing these eye therapy uh, exercises that the children needed to do. Her team of students involved not only students from the computer science area, but some engineering students who were doing the hardware development, as well as uh, design students who were creating the design around the, uh, around the game. She then went through, because uh, you had asked about, you know, what kind of programs are available to, you know, from the government to, to, to help researchers and, and businesses. She went through a program that has been funded by the National Science Foundation, a program called i -Corps, or Innovation Corps, which helps scientists and researchers look at the commercial, the commercial potential of what they're doing. So rather than spending more time, effort, and energy doing more development, the i -Corps program had her go out and talk to, and actually her whole team, go out and talk to 100 customers and find out really what their pain points were in terms of developing and vision therapy and what were the problems that patients had, what were the problems that ophthalmologists had. And that learning from the commercial market goes back and informed her development uh, activity. She was also ultimately able to get some external funding from the New Jersey Health Foundation and she and her now also 
working on trying to get funding from the federal government through a special program known as SBIR, which is Small Business Innovation Research, which are grants that are made available to only small businesses to help them do some further development work on technologies uh, that are of interest uh, to them. So there's a lot of external resources that are available. So the whole commercialization pathway can at times potentially seem somewhat daunting when you're in the lab, but you have to be asking the questions of a very simple question, who cares about this? The fact that I'm able to do this, is this something that's important to someone in industry? Is someone ultimately going to want to pay money for what I've developed? Is it faster? Is it cheaper? Is it better? Is it delivering a cancer therapy uh, more effectively? Because if it's not, if it's just a scientific curiosity, then that is not something that's going to be effective uh, in the commercial marketplace. Um, so I really think that the Oculus research that you were talking about is just so amazing. But um, apart from this, from you know your vantage point, um, seeing so many new, uh, seeing you know so many new ideas come in um, in hopes of being commercialized, what are the most promising and prominent areas of STEM research? So I think one of the things that we are seeing a lot of from the research perspective is really the combining or intersection a number of different areas that are coming together to solve problems. Big data and artificial intelligence from the computer science domain are bleeding into areas, as an example, in the life sciences area. There's so much potential clinical data available from, from drug trials that we're now going to be able to utilize uh, big data to help better inform research that goes on within a pharmaceutical company or a biotechnology company as they're able to bring all of this big data together to help find drug targets to be able to speed along drug development to potentially understand what drugs are likely to work in which types of patient, which is the, the whole notion of uh, precision medicine. So instead of developing a drug that we think is hopefully going to work for everybody, we're going to be able to hopefully at some point really have the personalized medicine that by understanding an individual's genetic we're going to be able to develop and give them the drugs that we know are going to be able to work directly for them. So that we're seeing this confluence of research from multiple domains uh, coming together to solve problems. Other areas that are particularly important and relevant are all of the STEM areas around the notions of sustainability for our planet. Uh, the UN has come up with 12 sustainability uh, objectives, and it is so important for us to have the planet have clean water, clean air, to be able to remediate uh, areas that have been that have been polluted. So that we're seeing a lot of very interesting research being done uh, across the broad area of environmental sustainability, whether it's things around new farming techniques that might be using less fertilizer, hydroponic, more uh, perhaps uh, genetically engineered or modified food products. There's just a lot of work going on in, in the notion of, uh, of those domains. Along with, I went, want to say, you know, some other really exciting areas involve really engineering intersecting biology as we're starting to see different ways that um, robotics are able to help uh, 
individuals who may have had uh, physical challenges. Uh, and, and then the whole sensor Internet of Things uh, set of capabilities so that there's technology from all of the domains are really coming together in, in very interesting and, uh, and exciting ways. It's really interesting that you highlight the, you know, that interdisciplinary nature of um, research because that's something that um, schools really um, push. And I guess, do you have any advice for, um, you know, as high schoolers, as um, entering college and in most pursuing something in STEM, any um, any pathways or anything that you think would help this sort of research? Sure. So students who are um, entering, you know, both, you know, both while you're still in high school as, as well as, as when you um, enter college, I would really, you know, say try to get involved with this concept that I had talked about earlier about getting outside of your comfort zone is take classes that are outside of your stated discipline or major that you're planning to study to see and think about how that might produce something that could be of interest uh, to me. I would encourage you to also, you know, quickly, you know, sign up for different magazines and publications that, again, could be perhaps a little bit outside of your traditional uh, yeah, whether you're going to read something on the computer or if you're an old school person like myself who, who still likes to get the, you know, the magazines in hand. So as an example of, you know, like one of the couple of the magazines that I read, and when I say read, I don't read every article in it, you know, in depth as if I'm studying it for, for an exam, but there's a magazine called Drug Development uh, and Delivery that has a series of articles about new technologies and how drugs are being uh, delivered, whether it's through devices or some new manufacturing uh, techniques. Another, you know, application in the life sciences area that I like to look at is medical uh, design briefs. And there was a uh, recent article in their March issue that was talking about rehabilitation robotics trends and it actually was talking about intellectual property regarding uh, you know robotic capabilities and so that was an interesting uh, article another you know publication that I like looking at is from the Association for Women in Science or AWIS and they have an both a print and, and an electronic magazine that you know that talks about and gives uh, not only role models for women in the science area, but you know, but talks a lot about some of the newer technology uh, capabilities. So I would encourage students to try things outside their disciplines. I would encourage them to get involved with uh, certain clubs or societies. At NJIT, we have a organization, the Society of Women Engineers. We have uh, computer engineering clubs. We have um, a group for Hispanic engineers, a group for uh, African American engineers. And so again, I would encourage students to get involved in in some of these different uh, different aspects. For some of uh, some of the high schoolers, if you are had had ever been involved in scouting, I would certainly encourage you to. To stay involved, with, uh, you know, with scouting, both Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, you know, provide a a base for getting out and doing, and if you're earning some of the merit badges that again are are give you opportunities to build and, and learn and do things of a uh, of a technical uh, technical nature. When you're in college, typically you also have an opportunity to do some community service. Work and at NJIT will do some work within the Newark schools where we're helping children uh, get a fold in 
learning how to do some simple uh, coding skills, and so you can get involved in projects of that sort or other uh, types of, um, of projects on campus, which can expose you to a wide range of, of activities. And, you know, one of the things I had mentioned earlier, you know, we talk about STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, and some people are now also referring it to it as STEAM, technology, art, engineering, and, and math, because you really are, bring, you know, we're really seeing that the artistic dimensions, the design dimensions are also important in, uh, in, in bringing things to, fr to fruition. You think about it uh, around computer science things as, as an example. Think about the app on your phone. You want a really nice user interface to make it easy for some to be able to utilize the technology that's being developed. So, so design is also a critical component of getting a technology uh, commercialized and uh, into the marketplace. The, yeah, the other thing I, I have to say, you know, one, one other comment, you know, I want to mention perhaps back along the, the technology commercialization piece is the whole aspect of partnerships and strategic alliances between multiple companies, whether it's big companies and small companies or two big companies together or industry and academia is that we're seeing that that partnerships are required to really bring some of these larger technologies to the marketplace. Thanks for the um, the advice. I'm sure a lot of uh, you know students will be able to use it no matter what they go into. Um, so I guess getting back to your work and the role of NJIT's Enterprise Development Center, um, what could you just explain the role of an incubator and an accelerator to the audience and just give us um, an idea of the failure and success rates of research that come out of these, um, these groups? Sure. So some of the early um, incubators were at and I want to say probably the first incubator was actually uh, set up in uh, Batavia, New York, and it was, I think, in an old uh, farm, which is why it got the term um, incubator. And so an incubator, think about it again as a, you know, kind of a warm space, little chicks to to grow. The notion of, of an incubator, and, and in our inner development center, we've got 100,000 square feet of physical space. It's, it's an environment for early stage startup companies to be able to get access to support and resources to help them develop their, their products and services. And by being in the environment with other early stage companies and with management uh, who runs the incubator, who's got experts on some of the business dimensions because typically many people who are starting businesses in our incubator are scientists and engineers who have less background on, on the business side. So the incubator is able to help guide the company in the commercialization uh, pathway. An accelerator program is similar to an incubator, but they are typically of a more limited uh, duration of time. Some of the accelerator programs may be a three-month program. They may involve in um, an extensive uh, boot camp of business knowledge that the companies uh, participate in and that it culminates in an accelerator program in some sort of what they call demo day where all of the startups who participated in this cohort, this boot camp learning program do a pitch to investors to try to raise additional funding. 
the traditional incubator programs tend to be of a somewhat longer uh, duration, and companies will stay in, in incubators generally anywhere from one one to three years as they're working on their uh, development of, of their product and service. Within New Jersey, there's uh, a number of uh, both business incubators and accelerators. Uh, we have a network of incubators known as the New Jersey Business Incubator Network, and we share information and resources amongst the, um, the various incubator and accelerator programs. So if someone contacts the NJIT and we're not able to assist them, we'll direct one of the other incubator programs uh, within New Jersey. Um, so, yeah, I think that was a, you know, very nice, clear explanation of uh, incubators and accelerators um, helped us understand the role that we had in your place. Mm-hmm. Goes on within research that goes on within the um, university. So now, specifically about women in STEM, um, women. There, there's a lot of discussion in the media and among um, professionals about the need for the presence of women in STEM. So, being in yourself, um, what do you feel are some of the most important and unique unique qualities? that women bring to the field of STEM? So, without trying to, uh, to stereotype women, because women, like men, have a range of, of capabilities, but I think it's um, sometimes v viewed that women have somewhat better interpersonal skills that they're bringing to to the table so that they may be able to more easily pull together teams of people than, um, than us. But I think that um, for, for, for women in STEM, one of the things is are frequently going to be perhaps one of a few people in a particular classroom or in a particular uh, setting. At NJIT, about 25% of of our student population is female, and that's about the same percentage of female faculty at at the university. And so, one of the things that is important, uh, you know, not only for women but also for underrepresented minorities, is to be able to see role models of others who are like them, who have been able to achieve their goals in these uh, in these areas. So one things that I like to be able to do is when we're working with other organizations within the community, whether it's Bio New Jersey or the New Jersey Technology Council, the New Jersey Entrepreneurs Network, other places where there's opportunities for speakers, we always are trying to ensure that we have role models such as yourself, who is really a great role model for young high school women to be able to see you as the and conducting the center, you, you want to be able to see others who look like you performing roles that you could potentially uh, aspire to. Uh, you may be wanting to ask about in some of the challenges about uh, you know being a woman in a STEM field. You know, certainly uh, being a Literature can involve long hours uh, in a laboratory as you're working on development. There may be setback activities, uh, so you have to be able to make make those commitments in terms of time to be able to uh, to push ahead with what you are working on. Uh, when I was starting out, there was a notion of work-life balance that you know that people talk about is how are you going to be able to to work and have a family and have children how would you be able to to balance all of those elements I think today people are more using a, of work life integration saying everything may not necessarily always be balanced but how do you integrate all of the things that uh, that you're doing I have to say one of the things 
that uh, has been a real change uh, from when I first started is that you now go to Trader Joe's and buy some really fabulous meals that you can throw in the microwave and within five minutes of being home you can have a meal on the table that is just an easy to eat and so you don't have to spend as much out as many hours cooking if that's not something that is of of interest uh, to you and when I you know first started working there was a lot of cutting up of carrots and sauteing of things to be able to get a meal on the table and now we're able to to get the cooking part done a lot uh, a lot faster Thank you for the kind words, but it's really professionals like yourself who our generation look up look up to, especially entering STEM fields. Um, also, just another question: How has the workplace changed since the time that you began your career? Told now, like how? Like I know you mentioned that it right. becomes mm -hmm. easy to handle um, the situation, but have you seen? Have you personally seen an increase in for example, women startups, uh, startups run by women, or um, you know, people coming. Here, like, what percent of what percentage of them are women? So, again, we're probably seeing at the business incubator again similar to what we have in our population at NJIT, about 25 to 30 percent of. The businesses are ones that are being led by a woman or a woman is in what we would call a C-suite position, whether it's the CEO or the chief technical officer or the chief operating officer uh, of the business. I think one some of the challenges that women um, within startups face is that they may not have quite the same um, support networks that uh, that other people that tr that traditionally men have and so it's important for us to be able to provide those other support resources uh, for them additionally there was fairly uh, interesting research uh, that came out from Laura Wong who was a Wharton professor who is now up at uh, Harvard University, and she was analyzing, and this could be a whole nother dis discussion, she was analyzing the kinds of questions that women were asked versus the questions that men were asked when they were pitching to in investors. And it, they discovered that men were asked more positive questions, like what do you see as the opportunities for your business, whereas women were asked sort of negative questions like, well, what are the challenges that you think you might face bringing your product to to the marketplace? And so based on this this research that, uh, that Professor Wong and, and others have done, you know, she is now coming out with some suggestions for how if someone gives you this negative question, you can kind of turn it around and answer it in a more positive way and to be more uh, likely to achieve some of the venture funding. You had also, you know, asked early on about the changes in the workplace. Well, technology has now enabled us, just as we're seeing actually here this evening, that we're in remote locations, talk, you know, talking on our phones. We're able to work almost anywhere, any place, any time by logging into the internet. Uh, our phones now have so much information you're able to work in the five minutes between the time the movie starts you, know, you, you sit in your in your seat in the movie and then the movie is is getting started so that in some sense work can, has a real opportunity to potentially take over your entire life if you're not careful so I think it's important for people to be draw a few boundaries between work and and the rest of their life so that they do spend some time relaxing recuperate recuperating rejuvenating uh, themselves um, so as we're coming to the close of our webinar we've really had an interesting discussion today about stem and specifically your work with the intersection of tech and business 
Um, so could we just get your final thoughts on, um, you know, the trends in STEM education or any critical pathways that we should be aware of? So, again, I, th I think it is so absolutely critically important for students to study some aspects of STEM and to really understand that technology, and in, and in particular information technology, really underpins a lot of elements that someone might be interested in. So if someone, as an example, says, you know, I, I don't think I'm interested in STEM, I'm, I'm really interested in fashion and retail, think about it. How, how are you buying things today? We're buying things on the internet. We're buying things on our phone and so that we're able to use technology really in all sorts of disciplines, not just the traditional things that uh, that you might have thought about. I think some of the other things that, w that we're seeing is really lifelong learning and short courses and credentialing. Some of the the newer skills that companies are, are interested in, whether a company is, wants to hire someone who's a social media coordinator for them, that would have been a job that no one would have been able to study for even 10 years ago or five years ago. And so now there's capabilities that people can pick up very quickly in sort of a short course, whether it's uh, online through uh, through Casera, which is one of the uh, great resources that people can look into to, to to take some courses online at no at, at no cost to really learn other sets of of capabilities. So really, lifelong learning is is an important aspect of things that uh, that people should pay you know should pay attention to. And I and I would say for uh, for girls, women, and, and minorities is really be on the lookout for for role models and and talk to people. Uh, one of the things we again could be a whole another lengthy conversation is to ask people for advice, to ask someone if they will potentially mentor, coach, or be able to to you know to to spend a, a couple of hours or a half an hour over coffee and a donut to to provide advice. So don't be afraid to, you know, to ask someone for their perspectives on, on how to move ahead. Again, thank you so much for that great advice. Thank you for your time as well. Um, it appears that we have one question from the audience. Uh, it reads, have you seen greater opportunities for women in STEM in recent years? Um, what are the number of women in upper management and what about pay equity? So um, that's a, a great uh, three-part uh, question. Uh, I want to say yes, there are certainly more opportunities for for women in in STEM fields. Uh, I think the same way we might not have 30 years ago seen uh, you know seen women in the military. There are certainly now more opportunities for women to get into uh, into the STEM field than before. I have seen some studies that have really indicated that women are still lagging in terms of some of the upper management uh, positions. And so it really becomes incumbent organizations to, as part of their strategic plan, make a deliberate focus on ensuring that they bring women and underrepresented minorities into their into the management ranks within their companies and also you know focus appropriately on ensuring that uh, that pay is is brought into line so that you with your human resources uh, you know organizations be assured that you're looking to ensure that pay is being distributed equitably uh, across race race and gender Again, Ms. Chef, thank you so much for being generous with your time today and providing us with some really unique insights um, into the world of research, the process of commercialization, and I guess the women, most importantly, the role that you play in facilitating a process that really brings some of the groundbreaking research 
into our daily lives that, you know, make our world a better place. Thank you. I've really enjoyed uh, chatting with you, and I hope the uh, audience who was participating on the call and those who may be uh, watching the uh, archived version uh, found it useful as well. I uh, do want to also end with, uh, I'll give out my email address in case anybody would like to uh, contact me. I'm always happy to, uh, to chat with other people. And my email is my last name, Sheft, S-H-E-F-T, at N-J-I-T dot E-D-U. And I'm happy to uh, follow up separately with anyone who would like to uh, reach out to me.